Thank you for having me here tonight. Uh, it's always an honor and a pleasure to address fellow veterans uh, and telling the story of this unit, the 143rd uh, Military Police Company. National Guard unit out of Hartford. Uh, they're out of West Hartford now. When we deployed, we're out of Hartford. And I make that blanket statement that nobody knows the story about them, even though these are your next door neighbors. Uh, can anybody guess how many guardsmen and Air National Guardsmen have deployed to combat zones since 9-11? Any guesses? How about 1,000? Two. Do I hear three? Five. Over 6,000 to combat zones. Some of them are one guy deploying three times. Uh, others are just blanking in. But 6,000. The United States Army, the whole United States military cannot go anywhere in a decisive action without the Guard and Reserves. They don't have the people. They don't have the depth. When we got deployed, this was supposed to be a one-year operation for Iraqi freedom. It lasted seven, and now it's still going on after we allegedly left. Guardsmen are still deploying. Uh, there's a guard unit doing a year-long NATO rotation in Poland. Uh, the 143rd, after I retired in 2005, went to Afghanistan. I would have been 60, so I stayed out of that one. When I say nobody knows the story, after we got back, I was asked to do Veterans Day presentations at the Hale Ray School over in Moodus, East Haddam. And that's what got me going, because I did the presentation, and it wasn't about just about Iraq, it was about me starting in the Marines back in 1969, and then carrying it through to 2005 when I finally retired. And so I discussed a lot of things, but the core of it probably was about Iraq and Baghdad. And one particularly bad night that we had, uh, October 26, 2003. Uh, we were out at the police station in Abu Ghraib. It was around midnight. Police station of Abu Ghraib is nowhere near connected with the prison where the scandal was. That's seven miles away. We got hit. We got hit bad. And the police station is manned and supervised by several units, not just one unit. So we had a squad out there. So we had our, our teams out there checking on them. Uh, the 527th, uh, an active duty MP company, had a squad out there. They had people checking on their people. There was an infantry uh, unit with a Bradley fighting vehicle for security. They had their people out there. So we had quite a few people out there that midnight when we got hit. Well, three people got wounded. Uh, two guys got their legs shredded. And one young lady got killed from the 527th MP company. While the explosions are going on, six MPs from Connecticut go under fire and rescue the three wounded soldiers get them across the open compound, get them into the concrete uh, building of the police station, and perform life-saving first aid on them. They were able to save the two guys. Uh, the young lady was dead on impact. Uh, but they CPR'd her for 45 minutes till they got her back to the cache, and uh, the doctor said, you know, she was done. So uh, part of that got me to write a book. One more slide. The 143rd in Iraq, training the Iraqi police. That was our main job. And next slide. This is Rachel Boswell. This is the young lady we lost that night. Uh, it's a <clears throat> still our personal tragedy in the unit. Uh, she's from Wisconsin. Uh, that morning she was killed. She was supposed to receive her first Purple Heart for wounds she had uh, received in a prior engagement. Uh, of course, she didn't make it. Next slide, please. One of the bomb craters in front of the Codger police station. Well, after I get down and I talked about Rachel uh, and finish the talk, this young lady comes up to me. And I'm not sure if she's a teacher or a senior in the high school. That's how old I'm getting to be, because I can't tell the difference. <laughs> so anyway, she goes, hey, my best friend was over there. We go out to dinner together. Uh, our kids play together. Uh, we even go on vacation together. She was over there, maybe you know her. And I'm going, okay, 165,000 in my rotation. I'm sure I bumped into her. And she goes, Andrea Cloutier. Like getting hit with a baseball bat. I go, uh, remember I told you six MPs rescued three people that were wounded that night? She goes, yeah. I go, Andrea was one of them that went in there under fire. 
I didn't know that. Did she bother to tell you that an SUV driven by a, a suicide bomber tried to take her police station down the very next morning when she was in there with her squad doing an inspection on the police station? She didn't know that either. Her best friend, kids play together, we go on vacation. Now as veterans, you all know that the person who comes on says, I was an airborne ranger green beret and then I cross trained for the SEALs, but they weren't tough enough. That guy, you kind of like, mm, yeah, okay. Like, the real ones, the real ones that are, you know, talking to talk and walking to walk, don't talk about it that much. Well, about two weeks after this presentation I was doing uh, at Hale Ray Middle School, uh, I was sitting next to the chief of police at a law enforcement function, uh, chief of police of Bridgeport, uh, Chief Gaudet. And when I found that out, uh, I said, oh, hey, chief, one of the guys I was in Baghdad with is one of your police officers. He goes, oh, yeah, who's that? I go, it's Alex Wilby. He goes, oh, yeah, great guy. I go, well, do you know he saved two guys' lives by putting tourniquets on their legs and starting out of these one night? Baghdad at Abu Ghraib? He didn't know. His boss. So this keeps repeating itself. Because every time I run into somebody who knows somebody in the unit, I, I relate a story about that soldier. And every time I do, they don't know what I'm talking about because they've never heard it before. Not that it's not true, it's true. So get on the computer. Dear Governor Malloy, now we deployed under Governor Rell in 03, but at this time, the Governor Malloy was the governor. Dear Governor, did you know that one of the Connecticut State Troopers assigned to your personal security detail is Andrea Cloutier, and that she, he didn't know it either. Metal, metal uh, Army Commendation with V for Valor for the six soldiers who rescued those troops under fire. The governor didn't know. So that was kind of the, the kick in the, the, the pants to get me to write. I figured I'd come up with 100 pages if uh, I tried hard. And it turned out to be 444 when I got done. But this was a crater in front of the uh, Abu uh, Qadra police station. Uh, suicide bomber was coming down the street, and he's looking up at the police station. Now, we were in what was called a monitoring phase. We'd only be in there for three, four hours a day, checking records, inventories, payroll, <coughs> stuff like that. Well, when they pull in, they put a machine gunner up and, uh, on top of the roof in a little fighting position up there. And uh, PFC uh, Levi Saucier was the guy who pulled that duty. And he saw the SUV coming down, and there's shops and... Uh, apartments on the opposite side, but it's a dead end. And so he sees him going down, and the guy is just looking at him. I was going to say I, but I'm not supposed to say I, him. So anyways, uh, Levi just doesn't like this guy. So as the guy gets down, he turns around. He doesn't pull into any of the shops or the apartments. Levi picks up his weapon and puts it, you know, right on him. And the guy sees him, hits the gas, and rams a concrete planter that had been placed as barricades in front of the police station. Got hung up on the barricade and he blew it. Now, the police station was structurally destroyed. It didn't come down, but all the walls were cracked, all the doors, windows were blown out. Uh, two of our soldiers, uh, Kenyon and Starn, were wounded, flying glass. Andrea was there and she was walking like she'd go right out the front door where the blast came through. She did one of these and she was a step and a half down the side hallway as the blast came out behind her. Step and a half. But nobody knew. Next slide, please. This is looking from the front of the police station across the crater. And those are all Iraqi shops and apartments. We, uh, we didn't lose anybody on our side. Uh, we lost one Iraqi police officer. but. Dozens of civilians were killed or wounded. Next slide, please. This is a position up uh, on top of the police station. And if you see these little, little squares here, those are concrete planters that were on our, our base. And we had what were called HESCO barriers. They're a chain link fence that fold out into a four by four square in line with Tyvek. You come with a payloader and film through a, you know, rocks and sand or whatever, and you got a barrier, a makeshift barrier. Well, we had that whole thing ringed up with those barriers and uh, Constantino wire, 
And when we went from manning and running the stations to uh, monitoring, the local police officials decided the Americans are out of our station. Well, we're not going to get attacked. Well, Lieutenant Groove, who was the company commander at the time, and Lieutenant Kerfoot decided, yeah, you're going to get some barriers. So two at a time, they loaded them up with our uh, five-ton wrecker, put them on a two-and-a-half-ton truck, and two at a time drove them out through the streets of Baghdad to put the, the, the barriers back in. It wasn't three days from the time they finished to the time the suicide bomber got there. Were there any estimates on how big an explosion it was? No idea. Just packed. There, there was so much ordnance laying around. Uh, it was packed. It was packed. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the position Levi Saucier was in looking down on him. He got blown out of the fighting position, uh, got banged up in a concussion, but he survived. Next slide. This is the front of the police station. A uh, person in the foreground walking towards us, that's uh, Staff Sergeant Cloutier. That's a uh, platoon sergeant next to her, uh, Sergeant First Class Lawler, and uh, Lieutenant Kerfoot. You can see the damage to the police station. All the doors and windows were destroyed. The building had to come down. Next. Uh, this is an award ceremony for those soldiers uh, on that day and several other days. That's uh, Colonel Garrity shaking... Uh, especially Starn's hand. He got a purple heart for wounds that day. Uh, next to him is uh, Sergeant Jessica Walsh. Uh, she was wounded in an IED attack. And next to her, closest guy here, that's uh, Specialist Kenyon. Uh, Kenyon uh, was wounded in the Kadra attack. Uh, you know, people talk about you know, veterans coming back and having problems and not being successful. Uh, Kenyon uh, just completed his PhD in criminal justice. He's a Groton Town police officer. Next slide. Uh, the tall guy on the far end there, uh, that's uh, Bartosz Wachowski. And he's straight off the boat from Poland. And he is a sergeant on the New Britain Police Department. He received wounds uh, in an IED attack along with Walsh. Next to him is uh, Sergeant First Class Lawler, uh, Army Commendation Medal V for Valor for the, uh, the Abu Ghraib attack, along with Staff uh, Sergeant First Class Porter and Staff Sergeant Andrew <coughs> Cloutier. Next slide. Uh, Colonel Garrity's pinning uh, an Army Commendation Medal uh, with V for Valor on Timothy Cochran. Tim, uh, in that photograph, is a specialist. Tim had uh, joined the National Guard as an enlisted man Went off to OCS, attained the rank of captain, was a company <coughs> commander, and retired. 9-11 came along, he insisted on coming back. The military, in their infinite wisdom, said, you can come back, you want to be an MP. The last rank you had as an MP was a Spec 4, somebody who's got two years in the military. You can be a Spec 4 or nothing. He came back as a Spec 4. Uh, next to him is... Uh, oh, that specialist Roberts. Uh, Roberts was my machine gunner. She's about this tall. My driver was uh, Melissa Roberts. She's about this tall. Uh, she was one of the six that was awarded uh, an Army Commendation Medal with V for Valor for rescuing those soldiers that night. Next slide, please. She's a mother of two. Uh, that specialist Cologne. Uh, he was one of the Medal of Valor's uh, recipients. Next, uh, Special Assessor Ballas, a New Britain police officer, uh, Army Commendation Medal with V for Valor. Next to him, if you look, oh, go back one. Sorry. If you look in between Colonel Garrity and uh, Special Assessor Ballas, you'll see uh, Kevin Arajado. Does that name ring any bells here? He's a police officer near town. Say he, his name again. Kevin Arajado. Police officer in the town of Cheshire. Uh, Kevin uh, got an Army Commendation Medal with B for Valor for uh, going out. There was a day-long battle in the uh, marketplace of Abu Ghraib, and they were screening a Bradley fighting vehicle. Uh, the Bradley can pretty much take care of itself, but if somebody snuck around behind it or got to the side with an RPG, they could take it out. And he and another uh, a number of members from his squad 
uh, screen the, uh, the vehicle to keep it from getting hit. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is uh, Alexander Wildey, Al Wildey. This is the uh, New Britain, uh, excuse me, Bridgeport police officer. Uh, and he had an Army Commendation Medal for uh, life-saving first aid, putting on tourniquets, and also uh, starting IVs. Next slide. Uh, this was the big commander for us. This was Colonel Russell Gold. He was in charge of everything in Western Baghdad. He was uh, uh, Brigade Commander, 3rd third, third Brigade Combat Team, 1st Armored Division. Uh, he was an overall responsibility for all of Baghdad, and we worked directly for him. To the right is our first sergeant, First Sergeant Jones. Uh, the fellow in the back, unfortunately, you can only see the back of his head. That's uh, uh, Lieutenant Shiverton, who is now Lieutenant Colonel Shiverton. And to the left there is Lieutenant Groove, who at that time was the company commander. Next slide. Colonel Garrity had uh, a soldier paint the names of the wounded and the people we lost in Baghdad on this uh, piece of marble that was inside our compound. We took over what I believe was the Ministry of Art and Culture. It had been stripped clean by the locals, so all we had were huge overdone government buildings. And there's quite a few names on that list, and unfortunately it got twice as long before we left. Next slide, please. Uh, this is one of our vehicles. We did not have armored vehicles, uh, fiberglass. Uh, it was hit by an IED. Uh, Wabrick was driving. He sustained serious injuries uh, to his face and leg and shoulder. Uh, Wachowski was up in the turret. He took a chunk of shrapnel in his back uh, body armor plate. We had state-of-the-art state, state body armor by that time, and we had these plates, they were ceramic, and they're called SAFI plates, and I got no idea what SAFI stands for. Uh, but they're about an inch and a half thick, they're ceramic, and they can stop a rifle round. And he caught that shrapnel right in the plate, it shattered the plate, uh, but if he didn't have the plate, it would have cut him in half. But the blast went through the bottom and blew, on, blew out the top. Next one. That's the top where Wachowski was uh, up there in the gunner's uh, hatch. We had no blast shields on the, uh, on the machine guns up there. You were standing up there all by yourself. Uh, on the opposite side underneath him was where uh, Sergeant Jessica Walsh was, and she took shrapnel in the face. Um, again, we had Kevlar helmets. And a couple of days after uh, this incident, uh, Wachowski was fixing the night vision goggles um, on her helmet for her. And all of a sudden, you know, drops the helmet, and what the hell? His hand's all cut open. He picks up the helmet. There was shrapnel, razor sharp, embedded in the helmet that he didn't see that was covered by the camouflage you know, uh, cloth. Uh, if she did not have her helmet on or if she did not have a Kevlar helmet, uh, she'd also been dead. Next slide. We sustained quite a few casualties. Uh, I'll get into that at the end. And one person remarked, well, you're, you're the National Guard. You know, you, you can't be expected to operate at the level of the active duty Army. Well, when we got to the 709th, they were supposed to deploy with their headquarters company, three MP companies, and a National Guard company would be attached to them to round them out. Uh, 709th ended up, showed up with one of their companies, a company they aboard from another active duty battalion, and six National Guard companies. Now, we had depth well beyond what the active duty had. We had veterans going all the way back to Vietnam. We had veterans from Desert Storm, Bosnia, Kosovo. We had people in Haiti and Somalia, but they didn't go with us on this one. So we, we, we had some depth there. Uh, our five officers, uh, captain and uh, four lieutenants, Three of them had been on active duty for an entire tour as enlisted men. One was an airborne ranger, one was an airborne light fighter, and another one was a tanker. Uh, we had soldiers that had served on active duty a full tour. Some of them, one guy did 12 years on active duty, and when the downsizing, they uh, you know, offered them an out. Uh, served in Germany, uh, served in Korea. We deployed the Dominican Republic and uh, to Panama. So we had depth there, and on top of that, 
we had 14 corrections officers, 12 municipal and city police officers, and seven state troopers. So they went through all the MP schools and all the local police academies or corrections officer academies. So we, we, had, we had depth. It wasn't a bunch of guys that only got around uh, one weekend a month, two weeks a year. We, we had some serious um, training and, and background there. When the 709th left, they had gotten there just before <coughs> us. We got transferred to the 168th uh, MP Battalion of the Tennessee National Guard. And if you look out to the right, you'll see those, all those state abbreviations. There wasn't one active duty unit in the battalion. Next slide, please. When I started writing this book, um, I had no idea how many books I was going to sell. And we were trying to get a, a map for the book, so we went to uh, DeLorem up in uh, Freeport, Maine, which is now owned by Google, I think. And uh, we tried to get them to give us a map that I could stick in the thing, but they wanted money. They said, well, how many books are you going to sell? I don't know, I never wrote a book before. So I put it off to my publisher. I said, you know, could you answer this question for him? She types back, 100,000. I'm looking at the screen. I'm getting $7 a book. No way. So I said, did you make a mistake and get the commas in the No, no, I think we can do 100,000. Next thing is, I'm not paying a penny in taxes. I don't care how much I got to donate. If it, I got to donate it all and not pay taxes, I'm going to do it. So I started looking up charitable organizations, and I haven't sold 100,000 books. <laughs> and there were a couple that you know, came up real quick, you know, Wounded Warrior, and then I looked at their charitable chart, and it was horrible. And then you know, I found this. And Fidelco provides guide dogs, in this case to uh, this guy from the Air Force, uh, to other veterans and, and other people too, but it was filling in the gap where the VA couldn't get you a guide dog. They were doing, uh, giving them uh, dogs, and the dogs are worth about $45,000 between their breeding and their training, and they go free to the client. Now, this guy, uh, I, I don't know if you can see it, but up on his left chest, he's got uh, paratrooper wings and uh, bomb disposal wings. And quite a few of the bomb techs uh, lost their sight, if not their life, over there in Baghdad and Afghanistan, diffusing the IEDs for us. And when I saw this thing, uh, again, one of the crosses I've got to bear, our guys came across an IED, pulled a perimeter, called EOD. Now, we only got like six, eight guys out there, and they're set up to keep people away from the bombs, not so much for their own cover. And Iraqis, for whatever, whatever, for whatever reason, oh, I, I've just got to go through to here. No, there's a bomb down there. Oh, no, I'll, I'll only be a minute. There is a bomb in the road. It'll only take a minute. I'll walk around. So anyways, time's going by. I'm in the operations center. I'm getting a little, I'm getting antsy. My guys are out there. They're exposed. I don't like it because when you're in a position like that and you, you can't really defend yourself, it gives the bad guys enough time to set you up and take somebody out. And so I'm, you know, do you like to get those guys out there? The EOD guys show up, and oh, fine, after a couple hours, because they're driving all over the damn city, bombs everywhere. They blew it in his face and killed him. So then I'm back there in the top going, oh, you miserable SOB. The thought you had about this poor guy in, so anyways, fast forward, we're getting ready to get on the plane to get out of there. Huge C-5, but they're only putting 86 people up in the uh, passenger compartment, and I've got the last half of the company to come out. And uh, Air Force guy, uh, loadmaster, comes out and goes, hey, Sarge, this is your plane, uh, but I got eight guys that you know, need seats, and you've got eight extra seats, but it's your plane. I can't put them on there, but if, if you'll take them, there's eight guys that want to get out. And I'm thinking, I got a C5. Who's better than me? And I'm thinking, I really don't think this is my C5. I think this the Air Force owns this one. So anyway, say, hey, anybody who wants to get the heck out of Baghdad can ride with me. 
I don't know what he thought I was going to do with the eight extra seats, maybe lay out or something. I don't know. So anyways, they all get on, and it's like uh, kind of unusual, eight-man de detachment. Who are you guys with? EOD. They went over with 16. They were going home with eight. Now, I didn't know it when I gave them the seats on the plane, or like I controlled the seats on the plane, but uh, you know, told them no problem. Uh, and they said EOD. I just kind of wandered down to the end of the runway and tried to get myself back together again. Uh, but we got out of there. Next slide. This is my cousin, uh, Bobby Youngquist. He's also a Cheshire resident. Uh, he's seven years older than me. And unfortunately, Bobby uh, was exposed to Agent Orange uh, when he served in Vietnam. Uh, Bobby never talked about his service in, uh, in the Army. Uh, when he came back, we asked him what he did. He said he was in Graves Registration. That kind of stops any conversation right there. I mean, well, who did you meet? You know, Grazer, OK. Well, then I see his uniform. He's got the infantry cross rifles with the blue circle. He's got the infantry corps. He's got the combat infantryman's badge. He's got the presidential unit citation. He, he was a grunt. He wasn't in Graves registration. He just didn't want to talk about it. And he never did. Uh, he passed away a couple of years ago uh, from the effects of Agent Orange. Uh, his sister, uh, Marcia Yonkwis Mongoluzo, gave him a kidney and bought him uh, 15 years of life uh, because Agent Orange was uh, debilitating his uh, organs and uh, gave him crippling arthritis. So all the money goes to Fidelco uh, in his name. Next slide. Ron Starmetal. These are the individuals that were awarded bronze stars over there. Uh, nine of us or something like that. Next slide, please. Combat Action Badge. This was, actually came out after we returned, but was retroactive to uh, September 11th. Uh, back during World War II, to recognize the infantry soldier from everybody else who was carrying the fight, they came out with the Combat Infantryman's Badge and the Combat Medic Badge. It was for the guys on the front line who were actually doing the, the fighting and dying more than anybody else. Well, Iraq and Afghanistan changed that uh, because there were no front lines. The front lines were whatever was in front of your windshield, and they started issuing combat action badges. These were awarded to people who were actually in direct combat but weren't infantry. The infantry still gets their, their uh, combat infantryman's badge. Uh, most everybody in the company uh, qualified for that award. We were in over 50 small arms engagements. Two of them lasted all day. Uh, and another 50 to 75 rocket attacks, grenades, IEDs. Next slide. Army commendation with uh, V for Valor. This is for you know, bravery under fire at risk of your own life. And those soldiers down there uh, were awarded. Next slide, please. Purple Heart. Uh, well, you're all veterans. You, you either get wounded or you, you die to get one of these, and I don't have one of those, fortunately. Uh, you don't see any names there. Uh, next slide, please. I couldn't fit them all in. Uh, if you look down uh, about midway, Specialist Oler. He is now state representative uh, up in Litchfield County. Next slide. Valorous Unit Award. Uh, this was uh, awarded to us about two years after we got back for our service in 2003-2004. Uh, according to the award citation, it's equivalent to a unit silver star for the way mine reads, uh, for consistent and repeated acts of bravery under fire. That's a unit award. The company got that. 
Next slide. And that's it. Yeah, uh, yeah, right hand side. <laughs> I'm getting my rights away. Yeah. Yes, you, you wear all your ribbons here, and the unit awards go on the right side. Yes? So a couple things. Sure. Um, the Fidelco guide dogs, I have a trainer at work where I work at Lincoln in Hartford. Mm -hmm. So I've seen her, you know, she brings the, and Lincoln's very supportive of that, bec you know, because of that yep. the trainer. And you see the puppies when they're little and they're coming on the elevator, and, you know, they want you to make noise, they want to. And, you know, the last one was like the best dog. And then I said, I go, geez, what had to, did you get find the service, somebody to serve the dog to service? But they said all of a sudden it started chasing the tail and they couldn't allow it. I mean, this, the guidelines for those dogs are very specific. Are so specific. And, I, and this was a great dog. I mean, there was nothing wrong with the dog, but they, if it was with someone who was blinded or something that with problems with the legs, if the dog decided to chase the yeah. tail, it could become a problem. So then if she goes, I got another dog. I'm like, oh no. Well, the, After a year, and this is a long time that she trained the dog too, but it's they had intensive. They had them for two years. <coughs> um, they breed them up there, and once they're whelped, they go out to families to be acclimated to a family yeah. environment, but they're trained the whole two years. Uh, but they stay with a foster family. Now the dogs that wash out go to police departments because they're a top shelf dog, it's just not right to be a guide dog right, for right. them. They just don't have that quality. So they go, you know, they might be a patrol dog, they might be a drug dog, they might be a bomb dog, uh, but they go there. And like I said, it costs $43,000, $45,000, takes two years to train them. Uh, the client gets them for free. When the dog gets placed with um, its new handler, its new owner, uh, they send people out because every environment's different. If you live in Cheshire, it's different than if you lived in Hartford. You know, you've got to learn your way around town. Do you take a bus? Do you walk? Um, do you catch a subway, if you have a subway? And acclimate the dog and the person to the environment so that they're gonna function and be able to you know, work as a good team. Uh, they go back during the course of the year, see how things are going, and do a retraining every year to make sure you know everything's tweaked right. And then the dogs are usually good for about seven years. They're nine years old. Uh, and then they rotate out. And my, uh, my other question was, mm -hmm. is, you know, you said you went in there for training for the Iraqi police. Mm -hmm. So what kind of, you we, know, like we, what, how, how good or bad <laughs> was that, you know, going in, what kind of condition to train them, were they, and what kind of problems did they run into? We had to start from scratch. We, the war officially ended May 1st of 2003. We had to wait for our gear to come into Kuwait, and we went north on May 9th and got to Baghdad on May 10th and went on the road May 11th on patrol. At that point, there were no Iraqi police officers. Their police stations had all been bombed or stripped or stripped and bombed, uh, so we were starting from scratch. Uh, for the first month or two, our guys were patrolling the streets of Baghdad as a law enforcement unit. We'd have one squad in the police station, we'd have another squad patrolling, and then the infantry would support us with a squad in a Bradley fighting vehicle or a tank to protect the police station. Mark, hold on a second. Would someone please turn on the overhead lights? Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll have to work Translators, or did they oh speak? no, uh, we had we had translators. Uh, some did speak English, but not many, not many. Especially the working guys, they didn't speak English. Uh, the higher ups, a lot of them did speak English. But we had to start from scratch, and it was everything from recruiting them. And Mr. Rumsfeld kept coming out with these crazy statements. They're going to run into your arms because we liberated them. Dude, we just bombed the hell out of them for two months. You know, they really don't like us. And people in the Middle East, I went to school as Saudis back in the 80s, um, they don't hold grudges a long time. They hold them forever. Uh, and they were still mad about Desert Storm and their family and friends and property that got destroyed back then. Now, we're walking in and the dust hasn't settled, and they really don't like us. 
and I can understand why they didn't like us. Uh, but Mr. Rumsfeld's like, oh, they're going to come back. You guys are out of there in 90 days. No, I don't think so. So we had to do everything from doors and windows to chairs and desks and pens and computers, cruisers, gasoline, generators, you name it. Everything that goes into a police station, we had, we had to provide. And we had Mr. Bremer, uh, the ambassador there, and uh, Bernie Carrick, who was the former police commissioner of New York, uh, setting up the police departments, allegedly, and uh, Mr. Rumsfeld and their schedule. And we are not meeting their schedule. I mean, these people just, they, they, they were telling us we could train the Iraqi police officers in two weeks. Now, here's Bernie Carrick, NYPD. His guys go through six months of training and then two months of ride along with another police officer in the city of New York. And the city of New York does not have an insurgency. And everybody in New York doesn't have an AK-47 where they do in Baghdad. And they came up with two weeks. And just some of the, 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 the crazy things, they decided that they would issue everybody a brand new Glock 40 caliber pistol. It goes about 600 bucks up at Hoffman's. And it's, where the hell did these things come from? All of a sudden, Connex boxes, the big metal container, showed up hundreds, if not thousands, of Glock pistols. And we're issuing out the Glock pistols as they go through the, the police academy range. They get like 60 rounds to them, learn how to assemble this in one day of training, here's your pistol. Our guys, it's you know a week of non-firing, talking about the pistols and the rifles, and a week of firing. And these guys, you know, one morning, here you go, get out of here. So on our monitoring thing, our guys are going out, okay, let's see your payroll. Okay, you've got you know 50 AK-47s in your armory. I see 30 here. You only got 15 guys on the road. Where's the other five? Oh, they're being maintained. AKs don't break. Okay, Ahmed, where where you you got an issue with a 40 cal? Where is it? Oh, it's in the shop being fixed. Dude, it's brand new. It came out of the box last week. They were selling them on the street. You, did you have anything to do with recruitment, or did, we, did you just go in and you had the team there? Because how hard was that? D d different organizations were doing the recruit, recruitment. We were doing the ride along and trying to do, a, okay, we're running the police station. This is how you run the police station, handing it off to them. Uh, they did have, the State Department had gone and recruited uh, retired police officers and police officers from uh, the states who could get time off to come over there and run a training class for two or three months and rotate through. Well, no, I mean as far as recruiting Iraqis to be in the police force because they knew that they were putting their lives, because if the Taliban knew that they were part of that. Correct. But they, they'd set up a desk and there would be a line of people to, to oh, sign okay. up. Yeah. Uh, suicide bombers uh, had, during the time we were there, walked into the line, blew themselves up, killing a bunch of potential recruits. The next day, table set up, and everybody just walks around the crater. Wow. They shrug it off, get back in again. One of the things they wanted me to do at the end, or one of the things they volunteered to do at the end, which was really stupid, was to train the Iraqi <coughs> chiefs and higher-ranking officers on executive protection. Because they were getting assassinated left and right. We'd, lo we'd lose a chief or a ranking officer uh, from our districts every week. And it's like, you know, guys, you know, just basic things. You've got to carry an AK-47 when you're in transit. Because you've got your driver. He's got to drive. He can't defend you. And if all you've got is a pistol and three guys came, came at you with a rifle, you're dead. <coughs> inshallah. Inshallah. God's will. They would invoke God's will kind of like we'd say, you know, well, yes, it's, it, it is the will of God or, hey, shit happens. <laughs> And, and you get that from them. And, uh, you know, I'm out there trying to lecture these guys to keep them alive because they're the hope for Iraq and they're our hope to get out of there because if they're dead, we're going to have to stay here and keep going. And they could care less. They could care less. Yes? Well, a lot of these stories about people who were supposedly policemen mm -hmm. and they were really terrorists. Oh, yeah. And they go in and they shoot up the Americans and the other. And did you encounter that one? Not that particular one, but we did have Iraqi police officers lead one of our squads into an ambush. Uh, they thought, 
they were patrolling together, and it's like, oh, we got to go over here. Okay. Well, now we got to go over here. Okay, we're going to sit here for a while. And now we got to go down this street. And it's like, yeah, what's going on? So they go, they're going down the street. Next thing you know, the Iraqi police crews disappear, and people are coming off the roofs, you know, cranking off rounds. Uh, they, they loved this and they hated this uh, all at the same time. And in, you could talk to them, and, and, and you know, we were the infidels. We were Christians and Jews. And you'd be working with them, and a conversation would go about, you know, you know, death to infidels, and go, oh, yes, 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 Bill, we, we must carry that out. And it's like, <clears throat> I'm an infidel. And, and they, they had no problem with it. Uh, the, they, they had a, a, a pilgrimage the Shia used to do uh, for a death that happened to Hussein, Ali Hussein, back in 600 AD. Uh, and the Sunnis were the one who killed him. Oh, those are two different religious sects there. Well, the coalition decided, we're going to let you have your hajj. The Sunnis didn't let you have your hajj or pilgrimage. We're going to let you have your hajj and your pilgrimage, uh, show just how fair we are, and that you know, you, you used to be the minor, uh, treated as the minority, even though you were the majority population. We're going to, everybody's going to be equal. So they have their hajj, and they go, and they, they, they slice their heads open, and they bleed all over themselves. They walk down the strip, street uh, whipping themselves uh, to atone for the death of Ali Hussein in 600 you know, AD. And they used that uh, Hajj to protest the coalition being in Iraq. And they wouldn't have had their Hajj if it wasn't for us, and they used it to protest us. Any other questions for Mark? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I don't know. Are you aware that Donald Trump was a free asshole? Who? I don't, know. I, I don't particularly care for him. Okay, you, there was a meeting in Washington, supposedly with Bush and Rumsfeld, and a decision was supposedly made what to do with the Iraqi army and, and police force. And they decided we should let them stay to monitor the country. The gentleman who was running Iraq, the political mastermind, I, I don't know who Bremer. Bremer got with Rumsfeld, and the two of them decided on their own to disband the military, the army, and the police force. But where the hell do you think all those weapons came, and where the hell do you think ISIS got started? The leaders of ISIS are the leftovers from the army, which our idiot politicians disbanded. That's right. And uh, none of this would have happened if they didn't do that. ISIS got our own weapons. Don't disagree with anything there. It could have been. It, it could have been a lot better. I don't think it'd ever be good, in uh, for us there. Uh, we're just we're just too different. You know, uh, they they've been around before Christ, populating these areas in the Middle East, and back before World War One, these were all city states. They weren't really countries. And then after World War I, the colonial powers, Great Britain, France, Italy, started ma ma making lines in, on maps. And OK, this is Iraq. OK, this is Iran. And without regard to longstanding populations and beliefs and religious holdings, they just started making up countries. And if you look at the map up here, along the top of Iraq, you've got Tur Turkey, Syria, Iraq, Iran, in that area, that's the Kurdish region. Except the Kurds are isolated from themselves because they're in Turkey, Syria, Iraq, Iran, and, and, and aren't a, they're a minority in all their countries, even though they control the whole top layer of that part of the Middle East. You know, somebody drew them out of the picture. Somebody the drew them. Hmm? And the Turks hate them. The, Tur the Turks hate them. The uh, Sunni and Shia hate them. Uh, another fellow I do presentations with, uh, a retired lieutenant colonel or colonel from the Marines, he was over there and trained the Iraqi 5th Infantry Battalion. And he had all three, or all three sects 
in his battalion, Kurds, Sunni, and Shia. And it was a real negotiation to get things done with them. And then one day, they're getting their orders. They're going out for the second battle of Fallujah. And his battalion is going to be taking all the holy sites so American coalition forces aren't going into the religious sites and the screaming going on there. Well, when the Kurds, when the Kurds hear that they're going to Fallujah, they're all dancing, jumping up and down, and dancing with each other. We're gonna, we're gonna kill rabbits. And uh, Mike's like, kill rabbits. What the heck is that? Kill rabbits. It's their slang term for Kurds killing Sunnis. So these guys are dancing around with Sunnis watching them. And they're all in the same infantry battalion. And it's, that's the powder keg that, that Mike had to deal with uh, in going to war over there. Yes, sir? So what's your recommendation for a sane foreign policy uh, by America to <coughs> Iraq and Iran? I would be making really big bucks if I had that answer. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't know. Um, We kicked their butt tactically in only a couple of months. And they, they couldn't believe it. Their, their, their uh, TV and radio before we got there was totally controlled. You, only select people had cell phones. Only select people had you know, satellite TV. So they were getting everything wandered through Saddam. Uh, and the illiterate population, which there, there's a lot of them, they were only getting their news from the imams broadcasting from the speakers and the minarets. So everything was very controlled. Well, they thought they won Desert Storm. They meaning? The Iraqis thought they won Desert Storm. They thought that after four days, we couldn't take the fighting and, and demanded peace, because they, we, they, the Iraqis, stopped us at the border. That was the story that played when they got back, that they had beaten the Americans. They had to do a tactical retreat out of Kuwait back to their defensive positions in Iraq and stop the Americans cold. <laughs> That's what they were telling us. We're, we're up there and it's like, how did you guys do it this time? Last time we stopped you at the border. Really? That's, that's how controlled uh, their information was. <clears throat> Any other questions? Mark, I just want to ask you a little bit about, and separate from Iraq, your you know duty there. So you were in Vietnam. What was just, your just a very, very little okay, bit? Okay, so I know you did some nuclear training or stuff like that, or what was your when I came back? Uh, I was stationed in Hawaii, and they sent me to Fort McClellan, Alabama, for a chemical, biological, radiological warfare defense instructor course. Uh, NBC, they we uh, you know learned to identify chemicals. You know, doing the analysis, we learned how to uh, decide how big a, a nuclear blast was by the cloud and do uh, radiation surveys and stuff like that. Right, any other questions for Mark? Yes, tell us about your book. It's, it starts in 1991 uh, with the unit coming back from Desert Storm. It was one of the few units. Uh, from Connecticut that actually uh, went to Desert Storm. Uh, at that time, we were, when we went in this one, we were called a Battlefield Circulation Control Unit, uh, combat MP, convoy escorts, security, roadblocks, checkpoints, raids, plus law normal law enforcement. When they went to Desert Storm, they were an enemy prisoner of war holding unit, and they processed some 35,000 Iraqi prisoners through their holding facility, uh, usually two to five thousand at a time. Uh, they went over there, they did their job, there were no incidents, and they came back, and then they the, called the MTO uh, uh, and made us a uh, battlefield, circula battlefield circulation control unit. Uh, we, we did raids, we were picking up guns out there and doing roadblocks, and uh, there's a picture in the book shows a room just stacked with rifles. And I thought we were doing a pretty good job. And then one day, uh, the sky lit up, all of Baghdad. 
bullets going every which way, hundreds, thousands, tracers going off everywhere, parachute flares, everything you could imagine going off. And it wasn't stopping, it was going on. It went on for hours. It's like, what the heck happened? Well, they killed uh, Uday and Kwasi Saddam's son. And so everybody was celebrating, all the Shia were celebrating. This happened another couple of months later. Shooting all over, they got Saddam. But this is shooting. We thought we had confiscated a lot of guns. We didn't even put a dent in it, what they were shooting. And they were shooting everything from little pistols to 50 calibers. And then a third time it happened, and they're shooting again. Going, okay, who got, who got captured this time? <sighs> Iraq beat Iran in a soccer game. <laughs> <laughs> Everything over there is a celebration. You shoot. Somebody got married. You shoot. Somebody had a baby. You shoot. Somebody died. You shoot. But when you win a soccer game, you know, you let it go for a couple hours. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for having me.